Long-time MP Russell Broadbent has quit the Liberal Party to sit on the crossbench, but says he remains a Liberal at heart and his values have not changed. Live to Sky News political reporter Joel Philp. Joel, a statement's just been issued by the Monash MP. It has. A 72-year-old has just issued a statement on the social media platform X. I'll read out a little portion of it to you now. To begin with, it says, Dear constituents, Today I resign from the Liberal Party and will move to the crossbench where I'll continue to represent the people of Monash. I am a Liberal at heart and my values have not changed. On Sunday there was a pre-selection where I received less than 10% of the vote. This was a clear signal from members and one which I believe revokes my licence to represent the Liberal Party in the electorate of Monash. So he's referencing what happened there over the weekend, obviously the loss, which he is said to have called humiliating at today's Liberal Party meeting of 161 votes to 16, losing out uh, to Mary Aldred there. And apparently what, what uh, Sky News understands is he stood up in the Liberal Party meeting that occurred this morning in Parliament, said that he was quitting the party, that he'd felt humiliated by what happened, and then walked out of that party room meeting. We've had a statement from the Victorian Liberal president about this situation, which I'll read out to you now. It says, the Victorian Liberal Party would like to thank Russell Broadbent for his 25 years of service as a Liberal member in the Federal Parliament. We wish him well for the future. Now, the Liberal Party at the last election held the seat of Monash when Russell Broadbent was still a Liberal, of course, by 2.9%. So its margin has been tightening. And obviously, this is also unwelcome news for Peter Dutton. Now, on the House of Reps, he only has 55 people within the coalition and the crossbench in the meantime has been swelling out to 18. Danica. And Joel, the federal government has revealed it will only fund road projects across the country if the states are willing to split the cost. Yeah, that's right, Danica. So the long-standing convention about regional and rural roads has been that the federal government pay for about 80% of the funding compared to 20% by the states. Now, of course, we've been waiting on this long-awaited infrastructure review. The federal government says it's sitting on at the moment and has been negotiating with the states and territories about what projects within the infrastructure pipeline to move forward on. This is interesting because cash-rich Queensland, effectively, the government there has been saying, we don't want any of these projects scrapped. We have a lot of revenue right now flowing in to the state government. So we want the federal government to push ahead with these projects. We have the money to do so. So this recent development, as you can indicate, would mean that if these projects do go ahead, if they're regional and rural roads, that indeed the Queensland government would have to be coughing up some more of that money. That's how these negotiations appear to be going. Let's take a listen to the Transport Minister, Catherine King. We're not just the bank. I think that's important to understand. We're co-investors in infrastructure and that partnership is important to us. The sort of um, incentives for managing cost escalations have not always been there. Uh, and our view, very simply, is it's important that we get more investment into those uh, regional and rural roads, but that we share the risk of those. And these concerns that the federal government have have really been echoed from uh, Infrastructure Australia. The head of that organisation, Adam Kopp, has said today that Australia at the moment does not have the workers, nor does it have the uh, funding to pull off all the projects in the infrastructure pipeline at this point in time. So governments will have to be making some tough decisions. You've got massive inflation. Um, you've got 13 rate rises um, and uh, you, governments really need to take a hard look at their pipeline and make sure that they're prioritising the most meritorious projects, the projects that tick the most boxes in productivity, mm. uh, decarbonisation and, and achieving livability for our communities. So, Danica, the federal government has yet to reveal which of the projects on a national level will be scrapped or delayed, but we do know that some of them will be scrapped. OK, Joel, thank you for the update.